Now, no matter what age you are listening to me this morning, I have no doubt at all that your mother or maybe another significant adult in your life will have said to you at some point, pride comes before the fall. You know the drill, you're doing something really well and you're excelling at it and you become more confident um, in yourself and in your own abilities. And before you know it, you've made a silly mistake or you've cut a corner somewhere and it all comes crashing down. And this is the issue that faced the children of Israel in our passage that we're going to be looking at this morning. Of course, we're tracing the, um, the theme through the book of, uh, of Joshua. We're tracing the history of the children of Israel and looking in particular at the theme victory through obedience. And our passage today looks at uh, the next stage of that journey in the life of the children of Israel where they come up against AI and are defeated at AI. And so really reflects on this, uh, perhaps a negative um, lesson for us, and that's important too, a negative lesson for us as to the, the need for this obedience to God in order to know victory in our lives. So we're going to read the whole of chapter seven. It's, um, it's quite lengthy, so bear with me, but um, it's much better that you listen to God's word being read, even that you listen to the, the preaching that follows. The, the w- reading of the word of God is far more important. So let's read these verses from verse one of chapter seven of Joshua. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not make all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about three thousand men went up there from the people. And they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about thirty-six of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shabarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel. And they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant which that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs to their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel. There are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes. And the tribe that the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans. And the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by households. And the household that the Lord takes shall come near by a man. And he who is taken with the devoted things 
shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near tribe by tribe. And the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought near the clans of Judah and the clan of the Zerahites was taken. And he brought near the clan of the Zerahites man by man and Zabdi was taken. And he brought near his household man by man and Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, the, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, Truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing fifty shekels, then I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent, with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent, and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel, and they laid them down before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold, and his sons and daughters, and his oxen and donkeys, and sheep, and his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. And the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. <clears throat> Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we, we thank you for, for this passage of scripture, that whilst it might appear to be um, a difficult passage, we know and we understand that because this is your breathed out word, O God, there is instruction for us today. So, Holy Spirit, would you help us? Would you teach us from this scripture to follow more closely and more faithfully the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we ask? Amen. There is actually, <clears throat> there is actually so much for us to learn in this chapter. The children of Israel, until this moment, they were doing so well. For the first time in the last 40 years, they had been obeying God and doing his instructions. All the males had been circumcised. We've noticed that as we've studied through this, um, through this book again. They were circumcised to mark them out as God's people, as an evidence that their hearts were changed by God to love, to follow and to serve him. And then they had celebrated the Passover to remember how God had rescued them from the destroying angel in, in Egypt and how he had enabled them to escape from slavery. God then gave them very specific instructions, didn't he, as to how they were to take Jericho and overcome it. Instructions that any battle strategist would scratch their head over. Yet the children of Israel did what God said and they gained the victory. Remember, the theme that we're looking at, victory, comes through obedience. However, in this chapter, we find that they hadn't done exactly as God had instructed. Or maybe one person had not followed the instructions. Achan, or the Jewish scholars among us would probably tell us that it's pronounced Achan. But we'll call him Achan, the westernised version for, for now. It's, uh, it sounds a little less that I've got something stuck in my throat. And Achan disobeyed God and went against his instructions. Now, nothing happened to begin with. 
they carry on with their strategy of overthrowing the inhabitants of Canaan. You can understand Joshua wanting to take another city quickly to consolidate on, on the victory that they, had, uh, that they had won. After all, this was what God had said to them, that they were to overthrow the people of Canaan. So Joshua sends out more spies to check out the city of Ai, about 15 miles from Jericho. And this would have been a, a, a difficult journey. It was only about 15 miles away, but it was probably about 2,000 feet higher in elevation from where they were. This was in the hill country. Verses 2 through to 5 give us the, the narrative um, in this section that we've read, how Joshua sends these spies out, and they come back with a battle strategy. But this was not God's strategy. There's no record of them inquiring of the Lord. This was human thinking. They were going by sight, not by faith. If they had applied the same principles at Jericho, they would never have attacked Jericho the way they did. Because when they went against Jericho in the last chapter, they were going by faith. God had instructed them and they were going by faith. Whereas when they came up against Ai, they were going by sight instead of by faith. They were confident in their past abilities. They were confident in their experiences. They were not trusting the Lord God to guide them and for him to deliver the victory for them. Clearly, they had not factored in the holiness of God and the fact that he is the all-knowing God. So they go ahead with their plans and they're routed. 36 men lost their life. The rest, the rest had to escape on the, on the, uh, the hill um, down from Ai back to, to Jericho. Maybe up until that point, Achan thought that he had managed to get away with it. He hadn't been found out and they were moving on in the conquest, moving on to the next city. Again, you will have heard your mother say, I've no doubt, be sure your sins will find you out. And this was ultimately what happened to Achan. But before he was found out, his actions had an adverse effect on others. Had they prayed, then God would have revealed to them that there was sin among them. And Joshua would have been able to sort it out and the other leaders with him. And the lives of those 36 soldiers would have been spared. Also, Israel would have been uh, saved from the humiliation of that defeat. Now, in verses six through to nine in this, uh, in this section we're looking at, Joshua realises that something is seriously, seriously wrong. When they're defeated in such, a, in such a way, he knows that something is up. But rather than seek the Lord's guidance and inquire of him, Joshua effectively here has a pity party, doesn't he? He echoes the words of the children of Israel in the early days when they came out of Egypt. You remember back then when they were hungry, they said it would be better if we'd remained in Egypt rather than starve to death in the wilderness. And Joshua here says it would have been better to remain on the other side of the Jordan in the wilderness than be totally wiped out by the Canaanites. But he does recognise, however, that if the Israelites became totally defeated, it would reflect on the great name of Yahweh, the great name of God. Verses 10 to 15, um, God then responds to Joshua's grief and gives him the instructions that he needs. He tells him effectively in verse 10, he tells him to quit the pity party. The issue is simple. Israel has sinned. And God warns Joshua in the second half of, of verse 12 of the passage that unless they deal with the sin, God will be with them no more. And for people who had known God's wonderful provision for generation after generation, and even for this people who had just entered the land to know their recent history of the last 40 years or so of how God had provided for them, how God had protected them, how God had led them and guided them through the wilderness and now into the promised land. For this people, for that threat that God would no longer be with them, 
That was the impetus that they needed to sort this issue out. So the, the Lord God gives Joshua instructions and tells him what to say to the people and what to do to resolve this issue. And in verses 16 to the end, 16 to 26, Joshua carries out God's instructions and exacts God's justice. He rises early in the morning and brings the people together. And God identified to him first the tribe, then the clan, then the family and the individual man who had sinned. And in verse 19, Joshua appeals to Achan. Now, this is not asking, have you done anything wrong? God had identified that he had done something wrong, that he had sinned. So there was no doubt in Joshua's mind about that. So Joshua asks him, what have you done? Achan reveals that he was tempted. And you may have noticed as we read the passage through that he was tempted in exactly the same way that Eve was tempted right back in the garden. We see how history repeats itself over and over again. The way that he was tempted, he saw a beautiful thing. He then desired to have it. He coveted it. And so he took it. And that's exactly what Eve did in the garden, wasn't it? She saw that the fruit was good. She desired to have it and she took it and gave it to Adam to eat. Joshua then sends messengers based on what Achan had shared with him. And they find everything in Achan's tent, just as he had said they would. Now, this is not just a case of Joshua saying, good lad, well done. You, you, you confessed, you owned up, now we'll forgive you. The justice of God had to be meted out. Now for us, Christ has come already. He has died in our place for the things that we have done wrong. That's what we've, we've remembered as we celebrated the, the communion again. That Jesus' body was broken. His blood was shed to pay the price for the things that we have done wrong. And in doing that, in Jesus shedding his blood and, and, and offering his body as a sacrifice, the justice of God has been meted out. Because Jesus took the punishment for my wrongdoing. But in this passage, Christ had not yet come. But the justice of God still needed to be meted out. The wrongs had to be punished if the children of Israel were to move forward from this event. That's what God had warned them. Unless you deal with this, I'm not going to be with you. So what do we learn from this passage today? As I said earlier, it's, it's not the, the easiest passage um, to consider and to read, but there is instruction for us today. I think there are four things that we can learn. There, there are more things, of course, but there are four things that I want us to focus on here this morning. Firstly, temptation is often at its highest when we are, quote unquote, successful. The children of Israel were right in the, the, the current of what God was doing. They were obeying his word. They were following his instructions. They went up against Jericho. They conquered Jericho in just the way that God had said. But then immediately after, Achan is tempted. He sees the shiny thing. It was a bit like a magpie, I suppose, wasn't he? He saw what was shiny, what was beautiful, what was attractive. He coveted it. He wanted it for himself and he took it. That temptation came immediately after the success of the overthrow of Jericho. And I think we can identify that in our own lives. Certainly, I know that. Sometimes you might preach a sermon that you didn't feel was was um, particularly good or brilliant, but people will come up to you afterwards and thank you so much for the sermon and tell you exactly what, what it meant to them and why it helped them on a particular issue. And the danger is you can become puffed up, you can become inflated, and there's an element of, dare I say it, success. Temptation is often at its greatest at that point. 
Those moments when you know that you're walking with the Lord and you're you're having good daily readings with the Lord and you're spending time in his presence and you, you know his presence with you. At times like that, temptation can come in. And this is what Achan faced. And this is a, a learning point for us. And the way that we overcome that is to remain ever faithful to God, recognizing that any success that we may have is down to him and is for his glory. It's not because I have succeeded. It's because God is mighty and he has helped me. So the first lesson, temptation often comes at, the high, at its height when we are most successful. The second learn, the learning point that we can take from this passage, defeat can be turned around to victory when we take it to God. Now, if God had allowed Joshua to continue in his pity party, where would they have ended up? Maybe even there would have been the temptation to cross back over the Jordan and go back onto the other side of uh, into the wilderness where it was familiar territory for them. But defeat can be turned, but only if we bring it to God. That's what the children of Israel did here under the leadership of, of Joshua and those that were with him. They brought the matter to God and God gave them the instruction and they carried out the instruction. And it references at the end of the passage where we, where we um, read in verse 26, the Lord turned from his burning anger. Because they came back to God, they came back to the Lord, and he turned the, the defeat into victory. Now, Arthur will cover that next week in, in his sermon. He will look at um, most of chapter 8 um, next week, and he will look at how the children of Israel were then able to defeat, um, to, to conquer Ai. But they were able to bring it back to a victory only because they bring it back to God. And that's just the same to us. I've mentioned to you before the phrase that, uh, that I used to hear a lot when I was growing up, that the point of departure is the point of recovery. I'll explain that again, as I've done before. When we go away from God's thinking and God's plan for our lives, we need to be brought back to that point to deal with the issue that led us astray. And when we come back to that point and deal with the issue, then we can move forward. We can turn the defeat into victory by coming back to God. I say we can turn the defeat into victory. It's God, of course, who turns that defeat into victory for the glory of his name. But it means that we have to come back to God. We have to repent. We have to acknowledge that he is the holy God of the universe. And as we repent and say sorry and turn direction so he can turn the defeat into victory for the glory of his name. The third lesson we can learn this morning from this passage. The sin of an individual affects the whole church. That's what happened here with the children of Israel. It was one man who sinned. I think actually... That's the sin of that one man was reflective of the whole of the children of Israel because they just went up in their own strength to Ai, didn't, didn't they? They didn't inquire of the Lord. So there was, there was something working through the whole people. But there was one particular sin. And that sin of Achan went right through the camp. The effect of it went right through the camp. As the children of Israel went up, they were defeated and 36 men lost their lives. There's a, there's a New Testament instruction for us in, in this principle. You go to Corinth, um, it could the, the epistle to the Corinthians, the first epistle to the Corinthians, and Paul speaks there. He uses the phrase, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now, wherever you read of leaven in the scripture, it always speaks of sin. Leaven is, is, a, is a biblical word for yeast. And those of us who enjoy our bread making, if you didn't have the yeast, the bread wouldn't rise. And so when scripture speaks of leaven, it's speaking about sin and the sinful nature that rises up and puffs us up 
just like it puffed Achan up. And Paul writes to the church at Corinth where there were major problems going on. And Paul says to the church at Corinth, just a little leaven, a little yeast leavens the whole lump, affects the whole lump. And this is the principle that the children of Israel were learning. Achan was the one who sinned, but yet the effect of that sin went right through the camp. And God was displeased with them. And there's instruction for us in that. You might think that your sin is hidden, as Jackie referred to in her talk with the children a little bit earlier. But nothing is hidden from God. It might be hidden from the elders in the church. It might be hidden from the rest of the congregation in the church. But it is never hidden from God. And if there is sin that is unjudged and not dealt with in the church or in the leadership of the church or in the family setting, it will affect the whole. If there's, unforgive, if there's unrepented sin in the church, it will affect the whole church and the whole church won't be able to move forward in, in, the, in the victories that God has in mind for us. And so the need is to come back to God, as I've already mentioned. Defeat can be turned to victory when we take it to God. The fourth point, the fourth and last learning point that I've got for us this morning, God's judgment should never be taken lightly. God is holy. He is a holy and righteous God. Yes, I know that the attributes of God mean that he is just. The attributes of God tell us that he is love. Not just that he is loving, but the very nature of God is love. We know that he is compassionate. We know that he is kind. We know that he is forgiving. But also, God is holy. He is set apart from us. He is absolutely perfect in every way. And because of God's holiness, his judgment should never be taken lightly. You say, well, Tim, um, that doesn't apply today because we're in the New Testament period and we're in the period of grace. Yes, we are in the period of grace, but God's judgment is still there. Now, it means God, God's judgment, of course, fell on Jesus. So when I sin, as I do, as every one of us watching this does, when we sin, God's judgment doesn't fall on us as it did on Achan. And the reason for that is because Jesus stood in our place. He hung there on that cross 2,000 years ago. And he paid the price, the penalty, for the things that you and I have done wrong. He did it all. He completed that work. So the judgment of God fell on Jesus. But sometimes God disciplines us. He puts certain judgment in the sense of restriction on us. But it's for our good. It's for our training. It's to, it's to lead us to follow him more faithfully. And the judgment of God, as I say, should never be taken lightly. I think one of the things that that should lead us to, and one of the things that that would have affected the children of Israel in their history, they would have remembered this event. They called the place where they stoned Achan the Valley of Achor. And they would have remembered this event, and they would have remembered, therefore, the holiness of God. And they would have warned people of the holiness of God. The generations that followed, people that maybe came in and, and, and became part of the, of the children of Israel, their slaves and, and, and that they took on and so on. They would have taught them about this event and taught them that this is the holiness of God and that God's judgment was not to be trifled with, was not to be taken lightly. And I think as we understand this principle that the judgment of God is not to be taken lightly, it should spur us on and encourage us to share the gospel, the good news 
with the people around us, whether it's in our families, our neighbours, our friends, uh, the, our work colleagues, whatever it is, it, would, it should inspire us to speak to them about the good news that Jesus came to take the judgment. Because if you don't accept Jesus as your saviour, you will face the judgment of God in eternity and an eternity in hell. People don't like us to talk about hell, but I have to speak of it because God speaks of it. He speaks to us in his word of hell and he speaks to us that his judgment must not be taken lightly. Yes, we can rejoice that the judgment of God fell on Jesus on our behalf if we trust him. But it should inspire us to speak to those who don't yet know him so they can come to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, so that the judgment of God will not fall on them. So these are just a few thoughts, these four lessons. There is, there is much more that we can take as well, but 30 minutes or so together doesn't do justice for this chapter. It needs, it needs several sermons, perhaps. But these four lessons, that temptation is often at its highest when we are successful, but when we're on the crest of the wave, when we're on the mountaintop, as it were. The second lesson, defeat can be turned to victory, provided we bring it back to God. The third lesson, the sin of an individual affects the whole church. And then the fourth lesson, God's judgment should never be taken lightly. Let us rejoice in the work of Jesus, that he has taken God's judgment for us. But let us be spurred on to take this message of the gospel, the good news that Jesus took the judgment of God. Let us be spurred on to take that message to those around us and those in our community for the glory of his great name. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we, we thank you that you were prepared to take the judgment of God upon yourself not for anything that you had done, you were perfect in every detail, but you took on the judgment of God against humanity, against sin, against the individual sins that we have committed. And we thank you, Jesus, for what you did. Help us now, we pray, to remember the holiness of God, to remember that we need to deal with sin in our lives in order to move forward, to remember that we can turn defeat into victory, and to remember also that temptation comes when we're often close to you, Lord Jesus. Help us by, by the power of the Holy Spirit within us to overcome such temptation and to walk in a way that honours your name and serves you. So help us, we pray in your precious name. Amen.